Thank you, Herb, very much indeed. And, and thanks also to Dennis Lendrum for this invitation. Dennis and I were graduate students uh, together in Oxford about 150 years ago. Um, uh, and just on that picture in the corner of, of my old man, uh, who died a couple of years ago, um, my mother said to me one day, she said, they've painted a picture of your father for the university. They've painted him dressed as a bee. <laughs> so there you go. Um, I want to talk about, your, your theme is research and discovery. And uh, I want to talk about the biggest piece of discovery that ever happened. The discovery of discovery itself, the, discover, the, the invention of invention, the moment when we became an innovative species, when we went through something called the human revolution and we suddenly started a headlong rush to constantly change our lives. Why did it happen to us and not to rabbits and rocks? Why did it happen when it did? What, 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 what explains this extraordinary event in, in human history? Um, and to, as my title, but. To uh, illustrate the point, here's an object that sits on my desk at home. It's an Ashwellian hand axe of the kind used by Homo erectus uh, roughly half a million years ago. My wife got it for me on eBay. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's genuine, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, roughly of the kind that Homo erectus used. And right next to it sits an object of exactly the same size and shape. And it struck me, really, that in this image of these two objects lies the entire history uh, of human development. We went from making things like that to making things like that. Why? What, what changed? What made us suddenly stop making? Because you see, the weird thing is that when Homo erectus would made that thing, let's assume it's half a million years old, that was towards the end of Homo erectus's time on this planet, he'd been making it for a million years to exactly the same design. The Ashwellian hand axe, teardrop shaped, sharpened all around, flattened from side to side, you can find it all over the world and you can find it from any date from a million and a half years ago to a half a million years ago. In other words, for a million years and in Asia and Africa and Europe, they made these tools to the same shape and design. How come? How come they didn't wake up one day and say, let's make a slightly different tool? This was the dominant tool of human, of human existence. And I think what that's telling us is that this thing was an expression of instinct. In other words, at the moment, there's a swallow and a robin nesting in my garden at home. The swallow's nest is made from mud, and the robin's nest is lined with hair. They always are. And that's because the, each bird species has an instinct to make a nest of exactly one kind, one shape, one material, one design, one size. I think that probably what was going on was that we had a, a sort of urge, an instinct, almost a genetic impulse to make it an object of that shape. Otherwise, it would have varied much more. Some, it would have varied with geography and it would have varied with history. And yet, at some point, that changed. Around 200,000 years ago, we started adding... We had technology before then, but we didn't have innovation. It's a really weird idea, but it's, it's true. And then something changed. We got the human revolution. We used to think it was a very sudden event that occurred roughly 45,000 years ago uh, when suddenly you get an explosion of new tools in the archaeological record. But we now know that that's an artifact of the fact that that was when Africans arrived in, in Europe. Uh, up till that point, this had been going on in Africa for 150,000 years, ab about. Sometime around 200,000 years ago, you start to get flowerings of new tools. And then they go away again. And then they come back again. You get these waxing and waning of, of technological diversity. Uh, but only in Africa. You don't see it in Europe. You don't see it in Asia. Uh, and it didn't happen, crucially, to the Neanderthals. Neanderthals were the European uh, um, uh, humans of the time. And they were terrific people. Uh, they were very clever. They had big brains, slightly bigger than us by the end. Uh, they almost certainly had imagination. We know they buried their dead. We, they, they, they had language, probably, because we know that the FOXP2 gene in the Neanderthal genome shows evidence of the same kinds of selective sweeps that happened in our genome. So, in other words, there's been strong selection pressure for linguistic ability in, 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 in Neanderthals. So, they probably had all the things we think of as human. You know, they cooperated, they, were, they, they had imagination, they, they talked, and yet they didn't change their tool technologies. They went on making things very like my... Oh, well, anyway, it's gone. <laughs> very like the, um, very like the, 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 the hand axe uh, for, for the entire um, 
uh, period, up until their disappearance 28,000 years ago. And so what was it? What, what, why were the Africans different? What was going on in their heads? Well, I don't think it was in their heads at all. I think we're looking in the wrong place. We're constantly looking for some gene that changed or some neural network that switched into a different pattern around that time. We're trying to find what the, the biological trigger that led to a cultural change. In fact, I think it's the other way around. I think a cultural habit came in that would lead eventually to biological changes. Because what probably happened was between the brains of people, not within the brains of people. If you think about that computer mouse for a second, it's not made of a single material like the axis. The axe is made from one substance, uh, just stone. The mouse is made of plastic and metal and silicon. And indeed, it not only embodies different materials, it embodies different ideas. The idea of computing, the idea of the, of the mouse, the idea of semiconductors. These are ideas that occurred to different people in different times at different places. People who are long dead, people who live thousands of miles apart, and yet these ideas came together within that one object. And if you look at our technologies, everything you're wearing today, everything that's in your pockets, everything that's in your possession is a combination of technologies. There is nothing that is a simple, single technology. I'm, I'm, I may be wrong about that, but I'm guessing that, 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 that when you think about it, everything is a combination of different ideas and different technologies that different occur to different different people in different times and different places. My favorite example of this, by the way, is called the pill camera. It's an object that uh, you swallow and it takes a picture of your insides on the way through. And uh, it came about after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. That's how innovation happens in our species. We combine ideas from different places. And that's the, that's the secret of, of, of human innovation, is that it's cumulative. We accumulate different ideas and put them together. Now, biological innovation is also cumulative. That is to say, uh, when, you, uh, d when a new mutation comes along, you don't replace an old mutation. You add it to the ones you've already got. And in particular, what you want to be able to do is sort of get a good idea from one individual, from one uh, lineage, and another from your mother's lineage, and so on, and combine them together and, and produce a better organism by combining these new mutations. How, did, how is that possible? Well, sex is crucial to it. If you don't have sex, then you can't draw upon innovation anywhere in your species. You rely only on your mother's 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 um, uh, lineage for any innovation. If you want to pull together innovations from all over your species, then you've got to be a sexual species. And that's what sex does in biological terms. It, in, it, it enables evolution to be cumulative because it can draw upon innovation wherever it happens in the species. So something changed in human habits that made our cultural evolution cumulative, just as sex made biological evolution cumulative. And I think it's the peculiar human obsession with exchange. Human beings are very unusual in that they love swapping things. From an early age, we're obsessed with, you know, children love giving you things if you give them something back. Uh, it's not true. If you, you, people have tried bringing up apes in, in human uh, uh, houses, and, and the one thing they don't get is the idea of sharing and swapping. It's a human fascination that we share and we swap. We, we do it obsessively. And Adam Smith, the uh, Scottish economist, famously observed that no man ever saw a dog make fair and deliberate exchange of a bone with another dog. <laughs> and once we started doing that, it had an extraordinary impact because it led to the ability of ideas to come together to meet and to mate. Ideas having sex, as I put it a few years ago in a TED talk in Oxford. And uh, because that had the same impact on cultural evolution that sex had had on biological evolution. That is really where innovation comes from. And we, we kind of see this because if you go and look at, there's a, there's a, um, there's a cave in the Caucasus where Neanderthals lived up until about 30,000 years ago, and then they disappeared, and the modern African people moved in after them. And the fascinating thing is that the Neanderthal tools are all made from local stone, whereas the modern humans are using stone that comes from up to 600 miles away. Not all of it, most of it is local stone, but the point is they're able to get materials from long way away through trade networks, through exchange patterns, 
Neanderthals didn't do this, and so they're able to get ideas from a long way away. So once we started exchanging, we started spreading innovation around. And you can see this showing up in fascinating patterns in prehistory, because what happens when you cut people off from these exchange networks is not only that their rate of innovation falls, but it actually goes into reverse. They disinnovate. They start dropping technologies that they already had. I mean, if, if all of us were suddenly marooned on an island, how many of the technologies we currently have in our pockets could we recreate? We'd have to simplify dramatically to, to, to suit the skills in this room. There are a lot of skills in this room, I admit, but still, probably we couldn't make everything. Tasmania became an island 10,000 years ago. And the people who were marooned on that island, it was cut off completely from the Australian mainland by rising sea levels, the people who were marooned on that island, about 4,000 in number for the next 10,000 years, uh, not only didn't get technologies that were invented later on the Australian mainland, like the boomerang, for instance, but they actually dropped quite a few of the technologies they started out with. They gave up making bone tools altogether, for example. And the reason is not because they were getting individually stupider or anything like that, but because their collective brain was too small to keep up the, the network of, of specialization and, 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 uh, and division of labor that enabled you to, to do this kind of innovation. We see the same thing in, in the Pacific before Western contact, that islands with a lot of trading contact had much more sophisticated fishing tackle than islands which, were, which had less trading contact. So trade is what drives innovation. And this has been the history of, of, of human beings right up to today. I mean, the, the great engines of innovation uh, in recent, in the last few centuries, have been the, the trading city-states in places like Renaissance Italy or Amsterdam or, or North America more recently. Now, remember I showed you that picture of the mouse and, and the ax. Um, who made that mouse? The answer is a lot of different people combined to make it. There was a project called Make Matt Ridley a Computer Mouse, and uh, an awful lot of people were working for that project. When you think about it, there were thousands, perhaps even millions of them, because there was a bloke who was growing coffee in Brazil, whose coffee was going to be drunk by a man on an oil rig, whose oil was going to be used in a plastics factory, whose plastic was going to be used to make the mouse, etc., etc. And they were all collaborating in this extraordinary way to produce this one object for me. They were all working for me. They didn't know it, and I didn't know it, but that's what was happening. And that's, by the way, why we have the lifestyle of a king today compared with our ancestors, because we've got so many more people working for us through this network of exchange that we have. have. Um, the, the great theme of human history over the last few thousand years has been that we've got more and more specialized in what we produce as individuals, but more and more diversified in what we consume as individuals. Uh, and this theme of getting narrower in our production so that we can get wider in our consumption compared with self-sufficiency, when you're, I mean, a self-sufficient person, maybe a subsistence, does more things productively than we do but he does fewer things consumptively. And of course, that engine can go backwards. And that's what you see when the, when the fall of the Roman Empire or even the Great Depression in the 1930s, you see people going back to being more self-sufficient, going back to consuming more narrowly, but producing slightly more widely. The division of labor, where I do what I'm good at, you do what you're good at, and we get a gain from trade by collaborating, uh, is not unique to our species. That's something that social insects do particularly. That's what ants, bees, and, and, and those kind of creatures uh, do. Um, and they get the same kind of benefit from it, but there's one big difference, which is that they only do it within the family. An ant nest is a gigantic family. And that's because they've delegated reproduction to the queen. They have a division of labor over reproduction. We don't do that. Uh, it's the one thing we rather like to do for ourselves is reproduction. Even in this country, we don't expect the queen to do it for us. <laughs> now, ask yourself another question about the computer mouse. Not just who made it, <clears throat> but who knew how to make it. Of all those millions of people who collaborated for making that mouse, how many of them knows how to make a computer mouse? How many people in the world know how to make a computer mouse? The answer is actually zero. 
There is no human being on the planet who knows how to make a computer mouse, when you think about it. The man who runs the computer mouse company doesn't know. He just knows how to run a company. The man working on the uh, production line doesn't know because he doesn't know how to drill an oil well, and so on. There's a guy called Thomas Thwaites, an artist, who a few years ago set out to, to recreate a £3.99 toaster from uh, Argos uh, from scratch, to make one absolutely from scratch, literally from the materials he could get out of the earth. And after about two years and a huge amount of money from the Arts Council, uh, he'd produced uh, a, a sort of huge and ungainly thing that would just about burn bread at the edges. <laughs> and, uh, and he was making the point that this extraordinary pattern of collaboration we have, we've created means that the knowledge of how to make the machines we use is not stored in individual heads at all. It's stored in the cloud. It's stored between us, not within us. And that's true of the simplest object, actually. Famously, I'm really, in a sense, I'm plagiarizing this idea from a, an economist called Leonard Reed in the 1950s who wrote about an essay called I Pencil, about a pencil which, which discovered that nobody knew how to make it. And that's really rather a wonderful idea. We think the cloud is new, that it's something to do with the web. But actually, the cloud's been in operation for 200,000 years. That's the gist of my argument. But of course, if I'm right that exchange is what drives innovation, then the fact that ideas can meet and mate much faster over much greater distances now than they could ever do in history because of the internet means that the rate of innovation in human society is going to go up, not down. People sometimes think we're running out of ideas to innovate. I just don't think that's true. I think ideas are going to meet and mate faster than ever in an orgy that will produce extraordinary uh, uh, possibilities in the future. So the answer to my original question is, wh why did this happen to us and not to rabbits or rocks? Why did it happen 200,000 years ago? Is that that was when we started exchanging. Now, once we started exchanging, we'd have got instincts for exchange. We'd have, we'd, we would have, it would have become instinctive to us in, in the way that I described, that children love swapping things and so on. Um, but those instincts would have followed the culture, not caused it. So it might have just been an accidental thing that a bunch of Africans sitting somewhere in, near a place called Pinnacle Point in South Africa, which is probably the earliest site of, 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 of technological diversity, might have suddenly one day just, just started swapping things, and the rest was history. Thank you very much.